8.55 Eastern Time. And Columbia and its affiliated stations bring you Elmer Davis and the news. Again today, the only war losses fall on the neutral. A Norwegian freighter sunk in the North Sea, just how we don't know, and an Italian freighter damaged in collision with an American ship outside a British port to which they had both been taken for inspection for contraband. The whereabouts of the city of Flint are still a mystery. Our embassy in Berlin asked the German government where it was, and in contrast with the experience of the Moscow embassy, at least got a straightforward answer. The Germans said they didn't know. Dispatches from Moscow say that the Russian papers have printed less than 100 words about the case. They've carried a good deal more than that on the Senate's repeal of the arms embargo. The newspaper Pravda said today that the repeal shows what the bourgeoisie means by neutrality. Russia's Supreme Soviet Council meets on Tuesday, and rumors come out of Berlin that it may announce measures that will mean the turning point of the war, perhaps the conclusion of a formal military alliance with Germany. But this is reminiscent of stories that have come from Berlin before now about what Russia is going to do, or, as it was in the early weeks of the war, what Italy is going to do, rumors that turned out to be without foundation. We do know some things that the Russians are doing, however. Their troops marched into Latvia today, on their way to occupy the naval and air bases on the Baltic, lately ceded to Russia. As the Russian troops came in, they found the roads clogged for miles by the automobiles and horse-drawn vehicles of Germans on their way to the ports, leaving the country where their ancestors had lived for centuries to settle in their new homes in conquered Poland. Russian garrisons have already taken their new stations in Estonia. In Lithuania, a third of the states where Russia is establishing bases, the Red Army has not started to march in yet, but is likely to come in this week. Meanwhile, since the Russians turned the city of Vilna, Lithuania's old capital, back to the Lithuanian government, the Lithuanian premier sent a message today to the Russians declaring that his people are imbued with sincere gratitude to the people of the Soviet Union and their leader Stalin. A few days ago, the newly elected Assembly of Western Ukraine, that is the southern part of the territory that Russia took from Poland, voted to join the Soviet Union. Today, an assembly elected in the northern part of the occupied regions, Western White Russia, took similar action, declaring that the Soviet power alone can rid the peoples of White Russia of exploitation, want, hunger, and oppression. All these areas, of course, are now occupied by the Red Army. Thus, the Russian frontier comes back to about where it was before the defeat by the Poles in the War of 1920. But the Russian negotiations with Finland still drag on. We hear now that the Finnish delegation won't go back to Moscow until Tuesday and doesn't expect to resume discussions till the latter part of the week. This delay seems to indicate that there will be a peaceful solution. At least the Russians are not pressing the Finns for quick action. Today, thousands of people gathered before the American legation in Helsinki, the Finnish capital, and the Coral Society serenaded the minister in gratitude for our government's moral support of Finland. Later, the crowd moved on to the Swedish, Danish, and Norwegian legations and serenaded them, too. But Helsinki had another blackout last night. They're still ready for whatever may happen. Our neutrality bill goes to the House of Representatives this week, with debate to begin on Tuesday and a vote expected Thursday or Friday. If repeal of the embargo passes by a margin of as much as 25 votes, it's about as much as its export as supporters expect. Our Washington correspondent, Mr. Warner, earlier this evening quoted Representative Rankin, Democrat of Mississippi, as saying that if this embargo is retained, war will never start. The peoples of England and Germany, said Mr. Rankin, don't want war and won't have it unless we agitate it. A somewhat similar view was expressed in a speech tonight by Representative Bruce Barton, Republican, who proposed that we keep the, re the possibility of repeal of the embargo suspended like a sword over the belligerents' heads if they don't make peace now. But that suspended sword may take quite a while to fall. The theory that the belligerents are waiting to see what Congress does about the embargo, particularly that the Germans are waiting for that to make an all-out attack, seems about as thin as the hope of some British newspapers that now the Allies can get 5,000 airplanes from American factories. American factories now producing military aircraft would take nearly a year and a half to turn out that many planes, and it must be remembered that a good part of their capacity is already absorbed by contracts with our own government. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. 8.55 Eastern Time, and Columbia and its affiliated stations bring you Elmer Davis and the News. With the neutrality bill coming up in the House of Representatives tomorrow, the German press today vigorously attacked American foreign policy. Leading the campaign was the diplomatic political correspondence, the semi-official organ of the foreign ministry, which accused America of a double standard of neutrality and said that one must be careful that a series of small decisions of each day do not lead to war again, as President Roosevelt once said they did in the last, did the last time. 
It was said that President Roosevelt's statement that repeal would not send Americans to the battlefields of Europe could not be taken too seriously because too much joy had been displayed over it in England and France. The lifting of the embargo, it was said, alone could not create such enthusiasm. The correspondents criticized Mr. Roosevelt's remark that one need not be mentally completely neutral as inconsistent with his concern for the preservation of peace. Further, it was complained that while America acquiesced in the British blockade, the city of Flint affair was made into a case with, quote, all kinds of propagandistic methods, end quote. But so far as we know, the State Department has objected only to the Russian angle of the city of Flint case, not to the seizure of the ship by the Germans. Other German papers, as our Berlin correspondent Mr. Shira reported earlier this evening, are quoting the attacks on American policy in the official Russian papers Pravda and Izvestia, which blame the capitalists and munitions makers for repeal of the arms embargo. Mr. Shira said that officials of the foreign ministry have no illusions about American opinion, but that the man in the street must certainly think that the Senate flew in the face of public sentiment. It is worth noting that this statement as to the difference between informed and ordinary opinion was, of course, passed by the German censor. The city of Flint came back today to the Norwegian port of Tromsø on the Arctic Ocean, the same port where the Germans first took her as a prize. This time, she was on her way back from Murmansk in Russia toward a German port if she can get through the blockade. The American crew was still on board, but the German prize crew was in charge when the city of Flint put in at Tromsø about noon and wanted to take on supplies. The Norwegians wouldn't let her have any, and she was escorted out beyond the three-mile limit by a Norwegian warship at four o'clock. German feeling toward the United States is not likely to be improved by the award today by the German-American Mixed Claims Commission of $50 million in damages to American and Canadian claimants for losses suffered in the Black Tom explosion of 1916 and the Kingland Kingsland explosion of 1917. We were, of course, still neutral then, and in these explosions, large quantities of munitions destined for the Allies were destroyed, according to testimony by German agents. Unfortunately, the German member of the commission had withdrawn, and the decision was made by the two American members. And the case is certain to be cited in the House of Representatives debate as an instance of what is likely to happen again if we again make munitions for the Allies. Lord Lothian, the British ambassador in Washington, tonight told, told the State Department that the liner Athenia sunk on September 3rd did not carry any guns, munitions, or explosives. This contradicts the statement of Gustav Anderson, an American passenger, who said that the chief officer and members of the crew had told him that she carried guns for Canadian coast defense and was later to be outfitted as a sea raider. Anderson did not say he saw the guns himself. Chief Officer Copland has now made an affidavit that there were no guns and munitions aboard and that he never talked to Anderson about the matter at all. The British note says that the Athenia was not sunk by a mine, by British submarines, by destroyers, or by internal explosion, but according to the British information, by a German submarine. Apparently, the note, of whose text we have very little as yet, even denies that the damaged hulk was sent to the bottom by British destroyers the next day, as was originally reported in London dispatches passed by the censor. What may be the most important news of the week is the meeting in Moscow tomorrow of the Soviet Supreme Council, at one of whose sessions Premier and Foreign Minister Molotov will talk about Russia's foreign relations. Every capital in Western Europe has a different story about what he's going to say. But a United Press dispatch from Moscow, admitting that there is no official advance information, says it is believed he will reiterate that the Russian government intends to maintain its neutrality. It is also said that he may redefine the relations of Russia and Germany, but there is no indication in Moscow that this means a closer alliance. And the Finnish minister, Pasakivi, is taking his government's reply back to Moscow tonight. Apparently it won't be completely satisfactory to the Russians, but the Finns are prepared to ask that all differences be settled by arbitration as an existing treaty provides. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. 8.55 Eastern Time, and Columbia and its affiliated stations bring you Elmer Davis and the news. Well, now we know where the Russians stand for the moment. Russia is the friend of peace-loving Germany and dislikes those imperialistic aggressors, England and France, and doesn't think much of the United States either. But Russia will give Germany only political support and will remain neutral. That is the substance of the speech made today in Moscow by Premier and Foreign Commissar Molotov. He said that Turkey would regret signing a treaty with England and France instead of Russia, which he said means discarding a policy of neutrality. He said, too, that if the Finns didn't come to an agreement with Russia, that would work out to the serious detriment of Finland. But he also outlined the terms Russia has proposed to Finland, which are not so extensive as has sometimes been reported. Though from the reaction in Helsinki tonight, they may be more than the Finns will accept. And he says that Russia has made no demands on Norway and Sweden. 
Further points that he brought out, Russia wants the war to end and Germany, too, is striving for peace. England and France are the aggressors because they want to continue the war, not for the sake of Poland or democracy, but for their colonial interests. It is not only senseless but criminal to wage a war for the destruction of Hitlerism camouflaged as a fight for democracy. Ideologies cannot be destroyed by force, said Mr. Molotov, which is a curious comment on the Russian repression of opinion that disagrees with the government. He added that a strong Germany is an indispensable condition for the durable peace of Europe. Molotov made two references to American policy. He said that the proposal to repeal the arms embargo raised justified misgivings. It would only prolong and complicate the war for the benefit of American munitions makers. Nothing was said, of course, about Russia's supplies to Germany, except that Russia will do everything possible to hasten the end of the war. It looks as if Molotov is thinking of no possible end, but one favorable to Germany. And in discussing the Finnish question, he said that President Roosevelt found it proper to intervene. You remember the president wrote that he hoped the good relations between Russia and Finland would continue. And Mr. Molotov said that one finds this hard to reconcile with American neutrality. He went on to say that Russia had recognized Finland's independence years ago, but that the Philippines and Cuba have long been demanding their freedom and independence from the United States, but can't get it. This interpretation of history seems almost as curious as his definition of neutrality. As for Finland, Molotov said that Russia wants to move the Finnish frontier back out of gunshot of Leningrad, several dozen kilometers far farther, but is willing to compensate Finland with territory farther north. The Finns are also asked to disarm their fortified frontier zones and to lease Russia some territory near the mouth of the Gulf of Finland for a naval base. And there is mention of additional mutual guarantees, whatever that means. On the other hand, Molotov declared that Russia does not object to Finland's fortifying the Åland Islands, and that while Russia had at first asked for such a mutual assistance treaty as was signed with Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, that demand has now been dropped because the Finns didn't want it. However, the Finns were furious tonight when they found out that the terms had been published, as they had apparently hoped to reduce them by further negotiation. Especially disturbing was the demand for the disarming of the fortified frontier. The Finnish mission, already on its way to Moscow, was ordered to stop at Viborg before reaching the border while the government considered the matter. Molotov's language sounds as if the Finns must sign on the dotted line or else. But what used to be fighting words in diplomacy are commonplaces now, so perhaps the dispute will still be settled without fighting. Mussolini's shake-up of his cabinet ministers this morning, his replacement of the heads of the Army and the Air Force, as well as the Secretary General of the Fascist Party, is generally taken to mean that he's getting rid of men who are too closely tied up with the pro-German policy of the Berlin-Rome axis. Not that the new men are pro-ally. High Italian quarters describe them, according to an international news dispatch from Rome, as strictly middle-of-the-road neutrals. German newspapers, as Mr. Shira reported earlier this evening, say that Mussolini's policies are not effective. But those policies have lately aimed at strict neutrality. And in the House of Representatives, the administration won the first test on the neutrality bill by a surprisingly large margin when it was voted by a majority of 60 to send the bill to conference committee. The real test, of course, will come on the motion to instruct the House conferees to keep the embargo. But it looks as if that will pass, too, though by a much smaller majority. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. There is warfare tonight between Russia and Finland. There is continued naval action in the West. And at this time, the Columbia Broadcasting System presents an analysis of these events by Elmer Davis and Major George Fielding Elliott. And now, here is Mr. Davis. The Russian attack on Finland seems to be regarded the world over as the most indefensible of all such actions that the totalitarian states have committed in recent years. The uh, Osservatore Romano, the Vatican City newspaper, speaks of a worldwide wave of indignation over Bolshevism's new aggressive policy, and from the dispatches we have received from all over Europe and from Washington as well, this seems to be no overstatement. The Italian press is evidently held pretty closely under wraps on this matter, but they have been vigorously opposed to uh, communism in recent weeks and have been criticizing it sharply, and it is said there is grave misgiving in Italian government quarters. There is, of course, a violent reaction to this in England and France and in the Scandinavian countries above all, where they are horrified by this attack on another Scandinavian country and uncertain if they may come next. As the Observatory Romano says, 
It is of essential importance to realize that this not only menaces the independence of a single country, but means the further progress of communism in Europe, end quote. Only the Germans content themselves with saying that Russia must have an outlet to the sea. And, of course, the communist explanation of this, as I have received it in a number of letters, is that uh, this is not aggression, it is not imperialism, that the Russians, if they go into Finland, will be doing so only for the purpose of liberating Finland. President Roosevelt, coming back from the South today, was met by Secretary of State Hull, the Union Station in Washington. They held a long conference later, and it is reported that the president may confer with the congressional leaders of both parties about foreign policy. This, however, is not confirmed. Remember that the United States offered its good offices to Russia and Finland to help in any way it might in the settlement of this dispute, and the Finns accepted this. But Mr. Potemkin, the Russian vice commissar of foreign affairs, told our charge d'affaires at Moscow that the offer came too late and he saw no occasion to use the good offices of the United States at this time. So the Finnish acceptance of the Russian terms the other day came just too late. The Russians had broken off diplomatic relations just before the Finnish minister could present this note which accepted the principal Russian demand calling for a withdrawal from the frontier near Leningrad and there is evidence for the belief that the Russians knew that this note was on the way and broke off relations so that they wouldn't have to accept it. The story of the Russian invasion was withheld from the Russian people for 16 hours, and when it was finally sent out, they said that they had to cross the frontier to repel a new Finnish attack. This is, of course, the same thing that Hitler said in Poland. This is a matter of counterattack with pursuit, and the Russians uh, insist that the Finns have attacked again. Now, as to this uh, allegation that this means the further progress of communism, Premier Molotov of Russia said yesterday that Russia has no intention of interfering with Finland's internal affairs. All they wanted is for the Finns to get rid of the government. And leaflets dropped in Helsinki this morning in the first flight of Russian aviators over the city said that Soviet Russia doesn't wish the Finnish people any harm. If they only get rid of General Monerheim, Premier Kayander, and Foreign Minister Erko, they will have peace. Perhaps relying on this rain of leaflets, people were out in the streets thickly this afternoon when another attack came, and then another, and the last attack was made at night by the light of the fires set by the earlier attack. Now we have a report which comes from Helsinki and is repeated in Copenhagen and dispatches from Helsinki to that city that Russia has sent an ultimatum which expires at 3 a.m. Uh, Moscow time, which would be 8 p.m. our time, demanding the complete surrender of Finland Otherwise, Helsinki and other cities will be wiped off the map, not leaving a trace, so runs the text of the story. And the Copenhagen newspaper, Berling Schettidende, reports that Mr. Tonner, the former uh, Finnish premier and finance minister, has been empowered to seek an armistice and also reports that the Finnish government resigns. Now, this is only the report of one newspaper in Copenhagen, although it is a paper which is very well informed about Baltic affairs. This is not a political story now. It's a military story. And here is our military expert, Major George Fielding Elliott, who can clear up some of the points for us. Major, where can Finland most effectively be attacked? Well, I think, Mr. Davis, that uh, the first point of attack on land is certainly the Karelian Isthmus between Lake Latiga and the Gulf of Finland. The narrow isthmus, about 36 miles wide, more than half covered by lakes, making the actual area in which the Russians can attack only about 15 to 18 miles. The best roads and railways between Russia and Finland lead through this isthmus. The lakes are not yet frozen. They've had a very late summer, or rather late fall over there. And the Finns have fortified the isthmus very strongly. They have a few gunboats on Lake Latiga, but of course the Russians can put in a very much stronger naval force on the lake. Moreover, the Finnish right flank here is exposed to attack direct from the Gulf of Finland. And indeed, the whole Finnish coast is exposed to such attacks, and the Russians apparently have already landed at one or two points, notably near Hango, which is one of the places they were demanding from Finland, near the entrance to the Gulf. The only hope here would be the intervention of the Swedish fleet, and that seems a pretty far-fetched hope tonight. The air support necessary for a Russian landing can be obtained from their new bases in Estonia. North of Lake Latiga, the Finnish frontier with Russia has no very good communications. It would be very hard to carry on any extensive military operations here, except that way up at Tetsuno on the Arctic Ocean, the Russians had a small concentration, which apparently has been strong enough to occupy that part whose fall is reported. That was another one of the places where the Russians 
for demanding concessions from Finland. Finally, Finland can be attacked, of course, directly from the air, and that appears to be the main uh, objective of the Russians at this moment. The Russian uh, Air Force is, of course, immensely superior Finnish Air Force, isn't it? What is the comparative strength of the land and air forces available? Well, the Russians have about 3,500 first-line planes. Of course, the actual strength of the Russian Air Force is not accurately known, but that seems to be a pretty good guess. And the Finns have about 200. The Soviet Navy has two old battleships, which are not in very good condition, and four quite new cruisers, plenty of 30 destroyers, and more than 100 submarines available in the Baltic. The Finnish Navy consists of two little coast defense ships armed with 10-inch guns, which are quite new and were built for the purpose of defending that exposed right flank that I spoke of, and a handful of gunboats and submarines. Nothing uh, very strong there. They, on the other hand, if the Swedish Navy could come in to help the Finns, they might possibly be able to upset, on sheer efficiency, the naval balance in the Gulf of Finland. The Finnish Army consists, in its first line, of three divisions, the Cavalry Brigade and a Chasseur Brigade, which includes the famous... Uh, Finnish ski troops. Total at war strength of about 70,000, plus perhaps 140,000 train reserves of all sorts. And the full military manpower of Finland approaches a half million, including the Civic Guard, Round Bear, and so forth. Russia has a huge army, said to total 14 million, including all classes of reserves, that can actually make available against Finland probably not more than 30 to 40 divisions. They total with corps and army troops of perhaps six to 800,000 men. Do you think there is any military significance in this reported ultimatum with its uh, threat of blowing Helsinki off the map if uh, it's not accepted? Well, this illustrates to me the possibilities of air power as a weapon striking directly at the civil will, at the morale of the civilian population, passing over the old situation where the enemy's armed forces had to be overcome in order to win a victory in war. It illustrates the helplessness of a small state with a large neighbor with an overwhelming air force as was already, of course, illustrated by the German operations against Poland, which air power for so important part. Air power will not be so lightly used, as we have seen in the West in this fashion, where reprisals are to be anticipated. This indicates further that Russia realizes the difficulty of ground attack because of the difficult terrain and wants to get this war over with as quickly as possible. Of course, we noted this morning that the very first of these Russian air raids was on the airport at Helsinki, so that presumably they were trying to put the Finnish uh, Air Force, such as it is, out of action right there, just as the Germans did against Poland. Let's say. Now, we've uh, had a story from Sweden that the Swedes are building up their own defenses. They have not proceeded to the extent of mobilization, but they're evidently calling up some new troops. But it is uh, pointed out that there is no obligation to lend any military aid to Finland. You thought that they said that the Swedish Navy was so efficient that it might be able to make head against the Russians in the Baltic? I think it's because if, of course, the Swedes are going to move at all. It seems that uh, there was only some Benjamin Franklin up there to repeat Benjamin's famous remark about hanging together instead of, uh, in order to avoid hanging separately. It might be a very good idea because those Scandinavian nations are certainly in a very bad situation if the Russians occupy Finland. I believe in your article in the Herald Tribune this morning, Major, you defined an aggressor under modern conditions as a small nation which has something that a great nation wants. And, of course, uh, that would apply to the other Scandinavian states once Finland is gobbled up. What do you think are the Russian objectives in this attack or possibly long-term objectives uh, when they once got past their initial objectives? Well, of course, the uh, Russian account is that what they want is the security of Leningrad, which includes an important industrial district and is pretty close to the frontier. And they want to get positions covering the Gulf of Finland so that Leningrad will not be menaced by any attack coming from the sea or from the Finnish frontier. There used to be a story going around that Finland was going to be a bridgehead for a German attack on Russia. If this is true, if this is still in the Russian mind, it is certainly a curious commentary on the present state of Russo-German relations. But... Also, we have a report from Oslo to the effect that Russia is going to demand three Norwegian ports on the Atlantic. Russia has always wanted an ice-free port. This seems to me to mark uh, the abandonment of the seeking of world revolution, uh, the revolution of the proletariat, by the old scheme of boring from within, because this most certainly will alienate foreign sympathy for the communist party and bring to an end 
any hope of the Communist Party getting anywhere in this country and in a lot of other countries, too. A return to the old methods of Tsarist imperialism and of the expansion of Russian territory and perhaps, of course, of communist influence by force of arms. It would be a slow and difficult matter for the Russians to get across the country in the northern part there of Finland, Norway, and Sweden, wouldn't it? The railroads all run north and south. There's no transverse railroad line. And so do the rivers, and there are terrific mountains up there. The rivers are all against them, so to build a railroad across to those uh, Norwegian ports would be a task of tremendous engineering difficulty. But, of course, if they succeeded in putting enough pressure on the Scandinavian governments, they might get session of all that territory before they had to occupy it. With Finland is a horrible example of what happens to people who resist them. Yes, exactly. Now, we had uh, one other story from the war in the West. Report of these uh, British, uh, the original story said British cruisers and later British destroyers, which were coming into a Norwegian port near Stavanger. And uh, they were said to have been reported, said to have reported that they had been damaged in the storm. But uh, there was some belief that they had been damaged in military action. What do you think the significance of that would be if oh. they actually had been damaged in a naval action? There was a report yesterday about a battle between British ships and uh, German aircraft off the Norwegian coast. It might have some connection with it. Apparently, from German reports, Vice Admiral Marshall, who commands the battleship squadron, was out in the North Atlantic at the time of the sinking of the Ray Wilpendi. If that was the case, he probably went out to cover the Deutschland and uh, escort her into port. And the sinking of the Ray Wilpendi re revealed the presence of the Deutschland and other German ships in this area. So the British concentrated off the Norwegian coast to try to cut them off. And then the German Air Force went out to try to break up this concentration and assist in covering the retirement of the German ships safely into port. And this certainly illustrates what has already been illustrated a number of times, the remarkable coordination the Germans are getting between their air force and their naval forces in the North Sea, from which the British might do well to take a lesson. Now that, uh, we had the story the other night, some of the German papers were saying that Germany commands the North Sea and the North Atlantic. Uh, that is certainly an exaggeration, isn't it? But uh, their, true, their ships are able to move about with more freedom than we would have expected. More freedom than they were in the last war, and if the vice admiral commanding the battleship squadron can fly his flag out from almost off the coast of Iceland, it indicates a considerable amount of freedom of action there. Well, thank you very much, Major. That seems to cover the military situation up to the moment, and of course, if these Copenhagen reports are correct, there may not be any further military situation. That is to say, if the Finnish government actually has resigned, and if Minister Connor has gone to Moscow to seek an armistice. We don't know whether that is true as yet, but we expect to hear more about it in the course of the evening. And so far, as far as we know, the Finns are still fighting. You have just heard Elmer Davis and Major George Fielding Elliott in an analysis of the latest developments in Europe. Eight fifty-five Eastern Time, and Columbia and its affiliated stations bring you Elmer Davis and the news. The Russian attack on Finland, or as the Russians call it, their counterattack against Finnish aggression, has, according to United Press reports, succeeded in eighteen hours in attaining its primary objective: the resignation of the Finnish government. At least that is what the Russians have said is their objective: the replacement of the Kayander Ministry by one which would be more friendly to Russia and would presumably be willing to give up the fortified frontier in Karelia and let the Russians have their naval base at Hunger, which the Kayander ministry has refused. In the first of the five air raids on Helsinki today, Russian planes dropped leaflets saying they had no wish to harm the Finnish people, and if they only got rid of Kayander, Foreign Minister Erko, and General Monerheim, everything would be all right. But later air raiders dropped bombs, not leaflets. Several fires were started in Helsinki, Forty people were killed and 120 wounded there, according to a Finnish broadcast picked up in London tonight, and Viborg, Hunger, and other cities were also bombed. Tonight, a report spread through the Finnish capital that unless Finland made a complete surrender by 3 o'clock in the morning, that is 8 p.m. New York time, Helsinki and the other cities would be wiped off the map by air raids, leaving not even a trace. According to the newspaper of Foreign Minister Erko, these reports should not be taken seriously but it is hard to see any other reason for the reported resignation of the Kayander government, which is said to have followed shortly after. The Finns claim to have held the Russians in the land fighting on the Karelian border. 
But the first day of the war evidently showed them that their 150 airplanes were helpless against the Russian Air Force, which outnumbers them 20 or 30 to 1. The new ministry has not yet been formed, and there's a good deal of speculation as to who will head it. The name most commonly mentioned is that of Finance Minister Tanner, the socialist leader who gave shelter to Stalin when he was in exile in the early days of the Russian Revolution. Tanner, however, was one of the negotiators who spent several weeks in Moscow this fall, vainly trying to get the Russians to reduce their demands. Apparently, Stalin's gratitude had no particular effect at that time. A Moscow dispatch tonight says that political observers there think that with the Kayander government out of the way, the Russians will consent to an armistice and resumption of negotiations, but there's nothing official yet. In the military operations of the day, the Russians occupied without opposition the four small islands in the Gulf of Finland, which the Finns had been willing to give up to them anyway, and are said also to have seized the port of Petsamo on the Arctic Ocean. On the land frontier near Leningrad, they claim to have advanced nine or ten miles. The Finns say the Russians were halted, but don't say where. Another attack east of Lake Ladoga in a region poorly provided with roads was only an attempt at a diversion. Public sentiment almost all over the world seems to regard the Russian attack on Finland as the worst of all the recent attacks by great powers on small states. Since until last Sunday evening, the Russians had not accused the Finns of anything except having something Russia wanted. And their subsequent stories of frontier incidents are not taken very seriously outside of Russia. The Vatican newspaper, the Osservatorio Romano, speaks of a worldwide wave of indignation, and that is supported by the stories from almost all countries except Germany. German newspapers, up to the time our last dispatches were received a little more than an hour ago, had printed nothing at all about the fighting in Finland. On the ground, as one German authority put it, that, quote, we have no confirmation of the news and the German press never publishes anything that is not fully confirmed, end quote. As W.L. White reported from Berlin on this network earlier in the evening, the German newspapers are printing a great deal about a worldwide wave of indignation, but that is about the British blockade. One sinking reported in the mine war today, a 2,700-ton British collier. The French say one of their torpedo boats sank a German submarine. There were isolated air actions over the east coast of England, and a damaged British submarine came into a port in the Norwegian island of Fosteroy. It was said, however, that the submarine had been damaged by a storm, and the Admiralty denied that it had been injured by German airplanes. The British announced the laying of a new minefield, covering some 300 square miles of ocean, midway between the mouth of the Thames and the Dutch coast. In announcing this, as soon as military considerations permit, they respond to the restrictions of the Hague Convention of 1907. The Germans have never announced the location of their mine. Premier de Ladier of France won a vote of confidence in the Chamber of Deputies today by a vote of 309 to 188. And a good many people in the conversation I have heard are wondering whether Sweden, Norway, or Romania will be the next nation to commit an aggression against Russia. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Eight fifty-five Eastern Time. And Columbia and its affiliated stations bring you Elmer Davis and the news. The defense of Finland continues under a new ministry formed today and the Finns have claimed successes in holding off the Russians. It is clear now that when the Russians, before the invasion began, demanded the resignation of the Kayander ministry, they meant that it would have to be replaced by a government which would take orders from Russia. For the Moscow radio announced tonight that Russia would not deal with the new government, which is headed by the banker Risto Riki, and includes the socialist Tanner as Minister of Foreign Affairs. But there is a group calling itself the Government of Finland, which suits the Russians exactly. It was formed today by Finnish communists on Finnish soil, but in a town ten miles inside the frontier, which was captured yesterday by the Russians. As if East Port, Maine, had been captured by a foreign army, and a dozen American communists met there and proclaimed themselves the Government of the United States. This so-called People's Government of Finland, headed by Otto Kusinen, the former secretary of the Communist International, has not yet been recognized by the Russian government, but the Moscow radio, which is of course official, says that Russia will deal only with this group. As the Finnish communists immediately asked the Red Army to give them all necessary assistance, the Russians can now say that they have been invited in by the government of Finland. The Moscow radio adds that when this government comes to power in Helsinki, it will assure the independence and security of Finland by friendly relations with Russia. But, of course, it isn't in yet. A statement by Prime Minister Riti, which was read over this and other networks earlier this evening, said that, I quote, We are ready to negotiate all questions, but we will not barter away our independence, end quote. 
In the day's fighting, the Finns claim considerable advantages. They say that on the Karelian Isthmus, just northwest of Leningrad, which is the scene of the principal Russian attack, the Finnish counterattack took 1,200 prisoners. At Tuoyarvi, northeast of Lake Ladoga, they claim to have repulsed the Russians with heavy losses, thanks to a new type of automatic rifle which fires almost as fast as a machine gun. The Finns further say that they destroyed 36 Russian tanks in the two days' fighting and shot down 18 planes. Reports that a Russian cruiser was sunk by the batteries defending the port of Hongo are unconfirmed. But in one sector, the Russians appear to have met with success. On the Arctic coast, they captured the town of Petsamo after heavy fighting. It was reported captured yesterday, but this time it appears to be true. And they're said to have occupied the 30-odd miles of Finnish coast between Russia and Norway. And Russian planes have raided Helsinki again and seem to have flown pretty well all over Finland. Three of them appeared above the Swedish frontier town of Tornia at the head of the Gulf of Bosnia, where the air raid alarm was promptly sounded, although no bombs were dropped on Swedish territory. President Roosevelt this morning appealed to both governments to avoid what he called the inhuman barbarism of bombing undefended towns and civilian populations. As a matter of form, of course, such appeals as this have to be sent to both governments, even if you think that only one is likely to do it. Tonight, the Russian Premier Molotov told our Ambassador Steinhardt in Moscow that this appeal was groundless and based on a misunderstanding, as the Russians were bombing nothing but airports. If that is the case, their marksmanship is pretty bad, for they've done immense property damage and killed and wounded hundreds of people in downtown Helsinki. Bombs have destroyed a German-owned factory in Helsinki. The German radio, in its only mention of this war tonight, said that the Russians had bombed the military institute and, aside from that, had dropped leaflets. But some of the leaflets seemed to blow up when they hit. President Roosevelt said this afternoon that this war comes as a profound shock to the people and government of the United States and that it was an instance of a trend which jeopardizes the independence of small nations on every continent. The Russian operations don't seem to be popular anywhere outside of Russia. In Germany, as Russell Hill reported earlier this evening, it was hoped that with the resignation of the Kayander government, the Russians would be ready to call off the war. Since they didn't, the Germans aren't saying much. Nothing much happened in the other war today except the sinking of two freighters, one British and one Finnish. But we have some real news from Japan. Tonight, the government radio says that Admiral Nomura, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, has notified the French ambassador that importation of arms into China from French Indochina must cease. When the Japanese say must, it is hard to see how the French in the present situation can give them much of an argument. And thus, what has been one of the chief sources of supply for Chiang Kai-shek's army is likely to be cut off. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Eastern Time. And Columbia and its affiliated stations bring you Elmer Davis and the news. While the Russians make slow progress on the third day of their invasion of Finland, the German press has suddenly discovered that Sweden is to blame for the war, or at least the Swedish foreign minister, Richard Sondler. The Felkischer Beobachter, the leading Nazi newspaper, says that if it had not been for Sondler's bad advice, Finland would have made a timely understanding with Russia and Germany. Dispatches from Berlin this morning indicated that there was a good deal of sympathy with Finland there. But tonight the tone is different, though so Finland is represented as only the victim of Sondler acting for England. The newspaper bears in Zeitung says that Sondler worked in Finland for England's interest and never lost a chance to show his antipathy to Germany. And the Essener National Zeitung, regarded as the organ of Field Marshal Goering, added that Sondler has long been the middleman of League of Nations ideologists such as Anthony Eden. The German radio tells the same story tonight. Sondler prevented Finland from reaching an understanding with Germany. Now, in a totalitarian country, this sort of thing does not happen by accident. When several German papers simultaneously discover that Sweden is the culprit, it's a sign that some sort of pressure is likely to be put on Sweden. Many observers have expected that after the Russians had overrun Finland, they would discover that their security was mentioned, menaced by the intolerable provocations of Sweden, but the Germans are pinning the blame on Sweden when the Finnish war has just begun. Germany draws much of its iron ore from Swedish mines and might not feel too comfortable if the Russians occupied Finland and got within easy reach of those mines. Perhaps the Germans want to get some sort of control over Sweden themselves before that time comes. So far as the fighting goes, the Finns claim they have stopped the Russians with a counterattack in Karelia and do not yet admit the loss of Petsamo on the Arctic Ocean, though the fighting there is very heavy. 
Herbert Elliston, reporting from Helsinki over this network earlier this evening, said the Finns claimed to have shot down 23 Russian planes. Air raids continued today on Helsinki and other Finnish towns, but so far the Russian Air Force doesn't seem to be making very effective use of its numerical superiority of something like 30 to 1. A later report from Mr. Elliston says that the weather at present is in favor of the Finns. It's raining and the lakes have not yet frozen over, which makes slow going for Russian tanks. There have been reports today that at several points the Russians attempted to drop troops behind the lines by parachutes, one of their favorite peacetime maneuvers, but that such attacks were repulsed. The Stooge, the Stooge governed the Finnish communists at Terioki, just inside the border, has signed a treaty of friendship and mutual assistance with Russia. In the treaty, everything is ceded to Russia that the real Finnish government refused to give up. The Hanga naval base, the fortified frontier, and all the rest of it. And the Russians, of course, recognize this group as the government of Finland. Mr. Elliston reported that the Finns say that not a single member of that group had been in Finland for 20 years till they came in behind the Red Army. That may be an exaggeration, but certainly its president, Otto Kusinen, has long had a good job in Moscow. In Washington, President Roosevelt urged the moral embargo on the sale of war materials to nations which bombard and machine gun civilians. This was specially addressed to American airplane manufacturers, who have sold about a million dollars worth of goods to Russia this year. The movement for the recall of our ambassador from Moscow as a gesture of protest, which Mr. Warner reported from Washington earlier this evening, was supported tonight by former President Hoover in a statement from Palo Alto. Meanwhile, the administration's policy has come under criticism from two sides. The communists blame President Roosevelt for the war on the ground that he supported Finland, and the Republican representative Knutson of Minnesota blames him for it because, he said, Russia is a Frankenstein which the administration helped create. He probably meant Frankenstein's monster, not Frankenstein. No news of the war in the West except the rumor that the Pope was going to ask for a Christmas truce. This was denied in authoritative quarters at the Vatican, the spokesman remarking somewhat pointedly that an armistice in the naval war would be meaningless when the sea is full of floating mines. The best-known casualty of the Russo-Finnish war to date is George Bernard Shaw. Mr. Shaw was quoted in a London paper today, and I have not denied it, as saying that Russia is only defending her own security and that Finland would not have resisted if she had not counted on American support. No man has written more eloquently than Shaw in the past in defense of truth and of the freedom of the human spirit. If what he says now about Russia and Finland is true, then all the best of what he's been telling us for the last 50 years is false, or vice versa. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Eight fifty-five Eastern Time and Columbia and its affiliated stations bring you Elma Davis and the news. On three fronts, the Finns won important victories today. But in the far north, Russian tanks and mechanized columns, aided by bombing planes, drove them out of their positions at Pitka Yerevi and in full retreat to the southward. For once, the Russian communique understated the Red Army's successes, claiming considerably smaller gains than are reported by neutral correspondents on the nearby Norwegian frontier. The Finns apparently mean to make a stand at Ivalo, which is about 120 miles from the Arctic Ocean. 160 miles north of the road and railroad junction of Rovaniemi, and some 200 miles from the head of the Gulf of Bosnia. A Russian drive toward Rovaniemi from the eastward was driven back today, and of course this northern attack is still a long way off, but the Russian mechanized forces seem to be moving fast. Another proof of the advantage the Russians get from mere numbers. The Finns can't stop them everywhere at once, and on this northern front they seem to have used their best troops and their best equipment. The Finns stopped them thoroughly today in the neighborhood of Suomasalmi, where they claim to have completely destroyed three Russian regiments which were dislodged from their positions a few days ago. For the moment, the dangerous Russian attacks in central Finland seem to have been brought to a standstill, and the question now is whether the Finns can shift enough troops to the northern front. On the Karelian Isthmus, Russian assaults were again repulsed. The Finns say they destroyed 36 tanks today and a total of 212 since the war began, but the Russians still have about 5,000 left. The 1st Division of Canadian troops under Major General Andrew McNaughton disembarked in England yesterday and today and will undergo some training there before going to the front. The transport fleet that carried them made the trip in a week under heavy ex escort of warships. The biggest air fight of the war took place off the German coast, apparently all the way from Wilhelmshaven to the Danish frontier, but it's pretty hard to find out what happened from the stories told by the opposing side. The Germans say they shot down 34 British planes and lost only two of their own, whose crews saved themselves by parachutes. 
The British say they lost only seven, not 34, and brought down 12 Germans. A few bombs were dropped at Wilhelmshaven, but apparently they missed their mark. Winston Churchill, in a broadcast this afternoon, said that within the past week, British submarines had sunk one German light cruiser and torpedoed two others, which, he said, may have been able to limp home, but will be out of action for quite a while. Reporting on the naval action off Montevideo, he said that for a time, the only British ships watching for the German pocket battleship Spey to come out were the three that had fought her, two of which had been badly damaged themselves, so the Germans perhaps had a better chance to escape than they knew. The German newspapers and radio still represent the operations which ended in the Spey being blown up by her own crew as a victory and say that she demonstrated her superiority over enemy craft. But Berlin dispatches suggest that one reason the news of the air cat air battle was broadcast so rapidly over the country was to offset the impression created by the sinking of the battleship. Captain Hans Longsdorf of the Spey and most of his crew crossed the Rio de la Plata and were landed in Buenos Aires today, where the Argentine government announced that they would be interned as provided by the Hague Convention until the end of the war. Those who stayed in Uruguay will be interned also. They had claimed that having sunk their ship, they ought to be regarded as shipwrecked seamen and allowed to go free, but this doesn't seem to have impressed the Argentine. The German government has sent a protest to Uruguay for not letting the ship stay longer, but it is pointed out by authorities on international law in this country that a neutral nation has a right to regulate such matters under its own laws, and that Uruguay, like the United States, signed a convention in 1928 which prohibits repair of damage done by enemy gunfire. Several ship sinkings today, but all small. The Norwegian freighter was mined and sunk with five killed, which brings the number of neutral Norwegian lives lost in the mine and submarine campaign to 99. German airplanes in the past two days have attacked many trawlers and other small craft off the British coast and have sunk half a dozen of them. The Tokyo radio tonight again attacked the Russians for lukewarmness and delay in making a fisheries treaty with Japan and says that it is reported that Russia wants Japan to cede her the North Manchukuo Railroad. It is out of the question, says the broadcast, that Japan will consent to such an illegal demand which shows the insincere attitude of Russia. And the Maritime Commission gave permission to the United States lines to put the big liners Manhattan and Washington back into service, running to Italian ports outside the combat areas. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Eight fifty-five Eastern Time. And Columbia and its affiliated stations bring you Elmer Davis and the news. The voyages of two German ships which left Veracruz last week to run for home came to an end today. A temporary end in one case, a permanent end in another. The 32,000-ton liner Columbus, overtaken by a British destroyer three or four hundred miles east of the mouth of Delaware Bay, was scuttled and set on fire by her own crew to escape capture. The American cruiser Tuscaloosa on neutrality patrol picked up 579 of the 630 men on board and will bring them in tomorrow to Ellis Island, New York. Whether any of them were picked up by the British destroyer is not known. The Navy's last report at 825 said that the Columbus was afire and slowly sinking, but that so far as could be learned, all on board had been saved. This incident appears to have occurred just outside the 300-mile safety zone proclaimed by the American republics at the Panama Conference, which has never been recognized by any of the belligerents. The Navy Department says, however, that, quote, so far as we know, no unneutral action has taken place, end quote, which apparently means no fighting. There is no indication as yet that the Columbus was armed. If she had been, she would hardly have uh, been scuttled to escape a destroyer. And the German legation in Mexico City says that she was not carrying cargo or fuel in excess of her own needs. That is, not acting as a supply ship for a German war vessel. In that case, her crew will presumably have the same freedom as any other merchant seaman in a neutral country. The other incident will be a much more pointed test of the whole doctrine of the safety zone. The German freighter Arauca of 5,000 tons was overtaken by the British cruiser Orion off Fort Lauderdale, Florida. When the cruiser fired a shot across her bow, she ran for shelter and managed to get safely into Port Everglades. Captain Friedrich Stengler of the Arauca says that he was just inside the three-mile limit when the shot was fired by the Orion. This is a matter not easy to determine, but at any rate, he was a long way inside the 300-mile limit. In the case of the naval action off Uruguay, the Admiral Graf Spey had herself sunk a British merchantman and attacked a French ship not far from the, south of the Amer from the South American coast. So the action of the Allies in attacking her seems to have been necessary to protect their own shipping. 
But if belligerent merchantmen can be attacked within sight of Florida beaches, we might as well give up the whole idea of the 300-mile safety zone. Unless the Orion really fired at the Arauca within the three-mile limit, however, her action was quite legal under generally accepted international law. The 300-mile safety zone was something extra which we tried to add to international law. It looks like a good idea if we can make it stick. The Arauca has, of course, the same right to the shelter of a neutral port as any other merchant vessel of a belligerent, such as the Queen Mary or the Normandy. Officials in Washington have held that an armed merchantman may use American ports if her armament is clearly defensive. That is to say, a gun or two on the stern, which wouldn't make her of much use as a raider. But the deputy collector of customs at Fort Lauderdale says that the Arauca is not armed at all, so there seems to be no ground for early reports that she might be in turn. As for the crew of the Admiral Graf Spey, the Argentine government today ordered the internment of Captain Longsdorf and approximately a thousand of his men who landed on Argentine soil. The officers will be asked to give their parole not to leave the city limits of Buenos Aires without permission. The men will be dispersed inland and forbidden to visit the coast. Otherwise, they will have pretty complete liberty and dispatches from Buenos Aires say they are enjoying it. Nothing much happened in the Finnish war today except a series of Russian air raids on Helsinki, Vipuri, and other coastal cities in which the Finns say no damage was done. These were all carried out by small groups, and the great masses of the Russian Air Force have so far not shown themselves in action. Finnish airmen raided Russian bases and supply columns behind the lines, and the Russians were evidently impressed, for Moscow had its first blackout tonight. The Russian advance in the north, where mechanized columns drove forward many miles yesterday and the day before, has halted for the time. But reports from the Norwegian frontier above the Arctic Circle say that 10 or 12,000 men with 200 tanks are getting ready for an attack on the Finnish positions at Ivalo. The Finns are reported to have told the Allied Supreme War Council meeting in Paris that they had strong hope of holding off the Russians all winter if they could get more airplanes, anti-aircraft guns, anti-tank guns, and field artillery. Dispatches from Denmark report that the British Air Force made three attacks on the German island of Silk near the Danish coast, but the British have no news about it. According to German stories, yesterday's air battle was the biggest air fight in history. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. 8.55 Eastern Time and Columbia and its affiliated stations bring you Elmer Davis and the news. France and England are about to start a diplomatic drive to try to line up the Scandinavian and the Balkan nations to resist further aggression by Germany and Russia, according to belief in Paris reported by our correspondent Mr. Severide earlier this evening. It is felt, he said, that the time is right because of recent German setbacks at sea and because the Finns' success in stopping so far the Russian army has been a serious blow to the prestige of the Stalin government. The Germans have apparently heard the same story for their radio tonight denounces what it calls the English attempt to use the Russo-Finnish conflict to get all of Europe embroiled in the war. This is represented in Paris as a purely diplomatic offensive, but of course it wouldn't get far unless the small nations were prepared to fight if they had to. The success of such a move in the Balkan countries might depend on the attitude of Italy, for England and France couldn't give much help to any Balkan state unless Italy's neutrality were considerably more benevolent to the Allies than it shows any promise of becoming. As for Scandinavia, the critical point appears to be the attitude of Sweden. The Swedish Committee for Finnish Aid announced tonight that several corps of Swedish volunteers will be ready within a few days to join the Finnish forces under the command of General Linder, formerly of the Swedish Army. Their number is estimated at from five to 10,000. An Amsterdam dispatch, quoting diplomatic reports whose nationality is not mentioned, says that 5,000 Swedes are in Finland already and that 10,000 more former Swedish regulars have been assigned to go to Finland as so-called volunteers, like the volunteers that Italy sent to fight in the Spanish Civil War. Till we know whose diplomatic reports these were and what is their possible motive, this story must be received with reserve. Yet the fact that volunteer units are allowed to be formed on Swedish soil certainly makes it difficult to regard Sweden as very neutral. Russia would find in this action sufficient excuse for moving against Sweden as soon as the Finnish war is over and the Swedish government may presently decide that it might as well be in the war all the way now as to wait its turn, especially if, as is suggested by our report from Paris, it can count on really effective help from France and England. But the Finnish war is far from over. As it ends its third week tonight, the Russians are still vainly hammering at the lines on the Karelian Isthmus, where they are beaten back every day and still attack again with solid courage the next day. 
Today, more than 200 bombing planes aided the attack, but still it got nowhere. There was fighting in north-central Finland, from which we have no news yet. On the Arctic front, the Russian mechanized column, which had driven down from Petsamo, was held up by a blinding blizzard whose immense snowdrifts immobilized the Russian tanks. 577 survivors of the German liner Columbus, scuttled by its crew 400 miles off the coast yesterday to escape capture by a British destroyer, were landed in New York this evening by the American tr cruiser Tuscaloosa, which was at hand when the Columbus was abandoned. Two men were missing. Though this was far inside the safety zone proclaimed by the Panama Conference, a zone which at this point runs more than 600 miles out to sea, the British warship apparently assumed that it had the right to act on the high seas even in the presence of an American cruiser, and the Columbus was accordingly scuttled and burned by its own crew. Several Latin American states, notably Argentina, are working on a plan to put teeth into the safety zone rule, perhaps by declaring that no belligerent warship injured in fighting inside the zone may make any repairs at all in an American port. Secretary of State Hull said this afternoon that he had no news of such a move, but predicted that the situation created by the disregard of the safety zone by both sides in the war would soon be brought to a head. The German freighter Arauca, which put into Port Everglades, Florida yesterday to escape capture by the British cruiser Orion, is still there and likely to stay there for quite a while. It was attached today in a suit brought by a Texas sugar company against its owners for failure to deliver goods ordered. The Orion is still there, too, eight or ten miles offshore, with American warships at hand to see that neutrality is preserved. And the Fort Lauderdale Rotary Club sent a Christmas present of magazines, cigars, and cigarettes to both the British and the German crews. In Japan today, an astonishing protest against recent Japanese, recent tendencies of Japanese foreign policy was made by a meeting of nearly 600 prominent men, including former Foreign Minister Arita and General Mazaki, once one of the most powerful men in the Russian, ar in the Japanese army. Their resolutions denounced any cooperation with Russia and urged the government, although in rather veiled language, to achieve an early ending of the Chinese war. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.